All right, great. Thank you, Ursula. We figure we want as many people to be chatting as possible if they're able to, if you want to. Always like giving that option. I don't know if anyone else out there also keeps about 14 tabs open, 28 internet tabs and 17 emails that you're supposed to answer the same way I do. Um, but it can sometimes make screen sharing a little bit difficult when you're looking for your one screen. I know I've got to get better at it. just joining us welcome make yourself at home we're just letting a few people show up hear some uproarious noise in the background. It's either a bunch of house sparrows outside teaching their babies how to fly or my wife trying to put my children into either the bath or bed. <laughs> All right, well, 7.33. On a night when we typically wouldn't even be having a BSG meeting, we're here. Um, and at a very unusual time, I heard George mention Israel and Palestine in uh, when we were just chatting in the other room. And there's some very interesting things happening in the world right now. Um, and I've been, you know, doing my best to, to research and and learn about. I have some friends who are native to Palestine and are sharing a lot on their social media feeds and I, I'm finding some stories there are similar to what's happened to Indigenous people here in North America and in Canada and in the Hamilton area. Um, George, one of our speakers tonight, was mentioning the amazing biodiversity that is found around the Six Nations Reserve, around Cayuga, around Caledonia. Um, oh, and yeah. You know, you could you could probably make some connections there. Uh, I'm going to mute George while he's there uh, as a panelist. Um, and so, wherever you're from, hopefully you have some connections back to your own homeland. I know I'm trying to do some research right now. Um, as my my descendants, I'm a descendant of of of, of poles of of both Irish and Polish, uh, and the name Hudecki was actually Chudeski, and we uh, we're from Krakow. Um, originally and my grandparents settled here and uh, I'm happy for it because I sure do love this area and um, of course recognizing that we're on the traditions of the Anishinaabe, Haudenosaunee, and the Huron-Wendat nations. Um, but if you're if you're looking to learn about the world um, you know there's there's no shortage of that and uh, and I'm, I'm always looking to learn more about what occurs around here. So part of these BSG meetings is just that, is learning about whatever topics we can. So I'm thankful that, that you are here tonight. We've got about 30 participants in the room so far, which is great. Um, and like I said, it's, it's our last meeting of the year. So we just tried something new with a bit of an open forum tonight, um, where from 7 to 7.30, we just allowed people to meet in a different Zoom room. And already we can work out some kinks with that, which is awesome. So tonight we've got a few things that we are hoping to uh, um, hoping to do that's kind of new for the virtual side of things and new to me as the new host of 2020 and 2021 after taking over from the one and only Bruce McKenzie. 
Our next meeting is, is going to be in September, so we take a bit of a break. Again, Mar a May meeting doesn't usually happen, so I'm, I'm happy to be having one here with everybody because everyone would be out in the field and probably some people are. I could imagine, you know, with some light still, there are those still on the trails and out and about looking for birds. So, um, but we'll meet back here in September. That hopefully is not going to be me sitting in an empty room, uh, dejected, waiting for people to show up. However, uh, I am hoping to learn about, to meet, to be introduced to, to have people sent to me, new speakers, guests, educators, doctors, biologists, you name it, organizations, anyone who would like, who you think, or who you know would uh, be able to, or would like to give a talk to us pertaining to Ontario birds, something that can pertain to these spaces uh, and the birds that engage with us around here. Send them my way. Send them our way. I'd love to meet them. I'm building next year's roster now. Um, so that would be awesome. So of course, until then, stay as safe as you can. I mean, COVID is still a, very much a serious thing in our communities. Um, so stay safe. And, and we're not running much, right? We're, 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 we're not doing too, too much. However, uh, I'll get to something in a moment. This marks nine months of us programming. So we started in September. So these have been our speakers uh, this year, which have been great. Um, Ali from Nature Canada, Kaylin from Birds Canada, Tyler Hort talked to us about the winter finch forecast, Michael Mazur from FLAP, Mike and Rob from Atlas 3, Gene Iron talked to us about penguins. I caught a Gene Iron talk about shorebirds. Oh my gosh, like they're my nemesis bird, only that it's so hard for me to wrap my head around what they all are. Um, so Gene spoke with us, Leanne Greaves talked about bird smelling, and last month Rob Porter gave us a great talk about bird listening. We are with my so thank you for sticking with us through the virtual side of things uh, i'd like to thank the bsg committee uh, most importantly i shouldn't say most importantly but off the hop michael rollins so if you didn't know this uh michael not only when we're doing in-person meetings and if and when we get back to that uh it helps handle some of the the virtual, the, the programming side of things by way of, uh, you know, the technology, the PowerPoint, whatnot. But he also takes very detailed notes and his notes helped land him and Leanne on the front car standing article written about Leanne Greaves' talk, Can Birds Smell? Uh, so Michael, thank you for all that you have been doing for the club for years, as well as Cheryl, and Arlene McCaw, now Arlene has, has announced that she's stepping away from the BSG, which leaves a spot to be filled if, if you or someone you know would like to take part in, in working with us in the Bird Study Group meetings, let me know. Mallory Pierce, who is a friend and a, a colleague of mine, has also joined and is, is helping with adding input. Right now, there isn't a ton to do, uh, but once we do start meeting in person again, that will change. So if you are hoping and wanting to do something new, look my way. Um, but many thanks to Arlene for all that she has done in the past and I'm sure all that she will continue to do. Chris Motherwell has been uh, the man behind the helms when it comes to Zoom and a lot of the technological side of things. So Chris, thank you. Chris's time as president of the National Resource Club is, is winding down. It's starting in September or October, he will transition into past president. And, um, and we will be welcoming in Bill Lamond as the new president and a yet to be named vice president. So look forward to that. So thank you to all of our guests, but most importantly to everyone who's been coming to these meetings. We, we I don't even know what we typically average by way of participants. Um, it usually sits around the 80s mark, which is awesome. So to everyone who's attended, whether this is your first or this is your ninth or this is your 600th, thank you for continuing to support the bird study group via the Hamilton Naturalist Club. Now, I had mentioned uh, we're not doing much because of COVID-19. However, I have been reached out to by a, a pal who has suggested that there um, is a need for chimney observers in the Hamilton area so that we slash um, keen organizations can get a better sense of 
of how many chimney swifts are going in and out of a particular chimney or two, where they're roosting. We've, we've got some ideas, and I say we, I mean, I've been sent some ideas of, of certain chimneys and stacks where birds have been going into, chimney swifts have been going into. Um, as I've learned, you know, like I've, I recently was, was observing chimney swifts at the Scottish Rite, and I, I counted anywhere from 150 to 170 of them a couple weeks ago going into that chimney, but breeding pairs will go to their very own secluded spot. Uh, so there's a, there's a whole host of chimneys that we're looking at eyes on. So if you live in Dundas, King East, Main West, James Street, Houston Lock, Stanley, Barton West, there's, there's, a, there's a few areas where chimneys have been known to hang out. So if you think that you would like to kind of help participate in observing some of these things, shoot me an email, birdstudygroup at hamiltonnate.org. So that we can kind of put together a bit of a list of who's able to help, who's able to do what, or at least just get a sense of how many birds are going into what chimneys. So look our way for that. I mentioned the organizations who are trying to assist with the, with this project or who have talked with me about this project. So I'm I'm just kind of leaving that kind of vague for you, but I'm sure I'm sure a few people can can gather the authority and putting that one together. Unfortunately, the spring bird count uh, is not happening due to the, the extension of the stay at home order. We will not take part in this inaugural, can we even call it that, year? Uh, but if you would like to stay in the good books about this, um, contact Chris Motherwell, cmtrain at cmotherwell.com to stay a part of it. That stock image I found is, is how a lot of us are, I'm sure, feeling these days. Um, a kind of happenstance fundraiser has, has been ongoing for the last couple of weeks, which I've titled the 2021 Bird Book Bonanza. So thank you to, to Jack and Lynn Hanna, uh, as well as the family of Jim Dowell for, for hooking me up with over 200 books, much to the, I don't want to say chagrin of my family who had to live in, a, in many towers of books in our living room, dining room area for a couple of weeks. Uh, it was a surprise to them. Let's just leave it at that. Um, we, I was able to find homes for 113 of those books. And, I, you know, I just said, pay what you can for a lot of these publications. And we raised 850 bucks. I also am in possession of Jim's cameras. And, uh, and I am looking to sell those uh, as another way to kind of raise money for the HNC or the Bird Study Group. So I've got an appointment to bring them to, I think, Burlington Camera tomorrow. But if you're looking to get your hands on some SLR cameras, look my way. I still do have 100 books or so or less than that. And so I'll post a link to that uh, in the chat when I'm done sharing these screens. You may recall uh, us talking about a goat fundraiser. So there was a matching campaign where a generous donator was saying, hey, we can match up to 10,000 uh, for this project where we were introducing goats to the Sheila, Sheila Dunduli Nature Reserve. We raised 10,000 and 10,000 was matched for this campaign. So again, thank you to everybody for your help and support with this. If you did contribute, thank you very much. And it sure is making a, a great effort on the space there. So I just thought I'd give an update on that. The area has been hopping since our last meeting. I know just in the, in a, in the kind of open camera session that we had from 7 to 7.28 that uh, we're talking about certain sightings and there've been some, some doozies, but it kind of feels like everything is, is, I mean, like there were reports of cuckoos mating today in Dundas, you know, there were, there's, there's, there's things everywhere. I, I had like a lease fly catcher in my, in my own backyard area last week and I heard a red-eyed vireo out there today and that's the extent of the birding I've done in the last four days. But in the area, Cerulean, Wilson's, Prairie, Golden Wings, Yellow-Throated Warblers, um, my goodness. Uh, a snowy egret was a big highlight today, so people are probably still chasing that as I'm speaking. Some evening grosbeaks. Here's a shot of an evening gross beak take, taken by Barbara Candy in Waterdown, which is a pretty great, they're returning north and they're passing through right now. So that's pretty cool. 
I've, I've still never seen a redheaded woodpecker despite Mike Rollins finding one a two minute walk from my house. Um, so they, they've been around, which is pretty great. Ruby throated hummingbirds. I just put scar tans in Indy bees for no real reason. I think I just forgot to change that to scarlet tanagers and indigo buntings, which is great. Um, orchard and Baltimore Orioles, sparrows, flycatchers, what are you seeing? Let us know in the chat what's been an, an eye popping bird for you um, this migration thus far. We'd love to know. Many ways of connecting with us if this is your first time joining us. So I, I keep this screen on uh, every month. So you can find the Hamilton Naturalist Club on Facebook, on Instagram, um, on Twitter, probably on LinkedIn. Uh, you can find Ontario Birds and the Hamilton Naturalist Club on Discord, which is a really cool app, who have just kind of undergone a bit of a rebranding saying, hey, we weren't really, this is a gaming platform. We weren't really prepared for community groups to take over the way they have but we have. So you can find a lot of great birding intel and Hamilton Naturalist Club intel on Discord, which is an app you can download to your phone and be part of the conversations there, which is really cool. Last month, we had Rob Porter talking with us. You can check out his podcast. He's constantly uploading new content there. So song birding is what you're looking for, which is cool. And if you uh, are looking to get emails sent directly to you, you don't want to deal with apps and whatnot, you could find us on a few different list serves Hamilton Birds, HSA Nature Notes, or Hamilton Beginning Birders. You can look up those three things and request yourself to join, and you should be welcomed in, and you can join in on all of the fun there. Become a member, that would be awesome if you became a member of the Hamilton Nationalist Club to kind of continue the support, to, to continue to support all of the endeavors going on right now with the HNC. Jen Baker, our one and only staff member, is hard at work in our nature sanctuaries and keeping things afloat and pushing things forth like the Biodiversity Action Plan, which is incredible. And I'm pretty sure, whether they, I don't know if they have yet, but I know they're hiring someone new because Carolyn Zankava, you know and remember, has taken a new role on, I think, with Conservation Halton. So congrats to her, and I'm sure we'll continue to stay in touch with her. And um, we look forward to meeting a new employee through the Hamilton Naturalist Club. So become a member. Uh, and if you'd like to volunteer, reach out to Mike McLeod and let us, let us know how you'd like to help. Again, you can reach out to me through Bird Study Group at HamiltonNature.org or through our website. Um, but let's begin. Let's, 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 let's dive into this tonight because we want to we wanna, we wanna talk about some stuff, right? This is a kind of a, this is just kind of a community Feel good night. There's in one speaker. We have three, um, but we do want to to give out a couple of awards. So um, this this is again this is another stock image I have. This is all of us flocking to you tonight to present to present greatness. So um, the bird of the year. Uh, there's a, there's a, there's a committee for the bird of the year and. It's decided through that, that team of, of what it is. They have their own criteria for it. And it was written about, but actually in the, the award winner. So I'm hoping Chris can find our award winner because the bird of the year was the brown boot being awarded to Nathan Hood. So Nathan said he was going to be popping on here around this time. So Chris, if you're there, perhaps we can, I'll stop sharing, and perhaps we can, we can bring, if, if he's here, if he's not out chasing birds around, he's here. which I, I'm not, is he here? Nathan, can you turn your camera on and your microphone on? The mic is, is on. Perhaps the camera's coming on next. Nathan, can you hear me? Hi, Jackson. Now we can't see you, but that's okay. You might not have a camera. How are you tonight? I'm doing great. How about yourself? Just dandy. Just dandy. Um, where where have we found you? Do I like who? I don't even. I don't even think we, you and I have met before. But you are the award winner, of Bird of the Year. Where are you? Who are you? Tell us. Tell us a bit about what's going on with you right now. For sure. Yeah. Um. Actually, I'm. I'm originally from Cambridge, so uh, I guess I'm not really too in touch um, with the, the Hamilton uh, birding community, but I did do a lot of um, Hamilton birding, you know, a few years ago. I was like, really, uh, I'd always be down just about every weekend, especially when I was first getting into birding. But, uh, and I guess that's, uh, you know, I've, I've been birding probably for about uh, 10 years now. 
Um, and especially, it just seems like every year it gets more and more, uh, I get more and more drawn and more and more uh, time is put into it. And, uh, and really, I just, I, just, I just love being out. And uh, so, so, yeah, I guess, uh, yeah, probably brown booby is probably one of the best birds I've ever, I've ever, <laughs> ever seen in Canada. And, and, uh, and, yeah, I mean, I won't get uh, too much into it, but, uh, yeah, probably, you know, one of the best birding experiences I've, I've had so far and uh and and yeah a funny thing is yeah the I think last September this the day that I went was like it had been about two years since I had been to or Van Wagner's beach and uh so it's kind of funny that uh, the chances of, of something like so big happening is uh is quite incredible but I'm really glad that uh really glad that I went <laughs> I, I mean I think a lot of people are really glad that you went because I mean what a bird. Um, you, you wrote a, a, a very wonderful article for the wood duck and you recalled the day quite excellently. And I mean, the photo that was provided was kind of, that, that's probably better than most people had a chance to even really see anyways, because I know that when I went, um, it, it wasn't on the wave tower at the moment and everyone was kind of like, oh, is it, is it, is it around? And it, it hadn't really been seen that day. And then sure enough, it flew in and landed and everyone freaked out. And, and you know, you can kind of tell there was a bit of a difference, but even with the spotting scope, it was like, what, how did, how, like, so you recall just seeing it flying, you just saw it flying in from afar? Like, tell us what was going on in that moment. Uh-oh. If you're talking, we can't hear you. Sorry, uh, I, uh, my internet connection is a little bit unstable. There you are. There you are. You're back. You, yeah, you, you wrote about it. You wrote about it a little bit about, about what, it was, what, what was happening in that moment. But for anyone who didn't read it, um, yeah. And if your connection's poor, we, we can keep it brief. But yeah, what do you think? Sorry, uh, I actually just cut out the last two minutes. So I didn't hear the, I guess, the question or... Uh... Now that's okay. I was just wondering, you know, you wrote in the article, um, and for those who had had a chance to read it, you so you just were scanning, looking at Savin's Galls, looking at Jaegers, and then you just, you saw a fixture coming in from afar? Like, <laughs> explain what was going on in that moment. Right, yeah, so I'd say about, yeah, a few kilometers, I think, from shore, there was this, uh, you know, this very large bird, very slow wing beats, uh, approaching, basically, dead on, dead center, uh, towards um, the Lakeland Center. And, you know, I, I first, I, I think the first thing I said, oh, I think, uh, I think I called out Jaeger because, uh, <laughs> you know, my skills are a little rusty for Jaeger ID. So I, I will admit that, uh, um, yeah, that, that was my like initial thought. But at that time, of course, you know, it's a few kilometers out. So it's nothing more than a speck from the horizon, which, which is, you know, a lot of the time there, it's, uh, you know, you, you don't get that lucky to get that close to Jaegers anyways, but uh, this bird just kept, kept coming in and, in. and, uh, and after a while, you know, after I said that, I, I stayed silent for maybe a minute or two and uh, just, you know, a lot of stuff was like processing through my head and, uh, and it just got closer and closer. And uh, so I got a few people around me on it too. And I'm like, this is, you know, this thing, like, this is, this is something big. This is, I don't, I don't even know what this is and, uh, or at least not um, right away. And uh, slowly, like gears were starting to turn in my head, and uh, and that thing, and then eventually it got you know close enough to the wave tower that you know I see this like uh, you know white-bellied bird, and and uh, this this huge pale bill, and I'm like, and this thing lands, and I was like, you know, I think the second it landed, or sometime around then, it was like that's when it hit me, and it was like, and I think it hit the other people that were around me too because we all kind of just stared at each other for a little bit and was like yeah like booby <laughs> and uh and I, I remember like right away it was, I, I took it it seemed so casual like I, I don't think the the actual how how crazy that was really you know really hit me until and, and probably the others too until like well after and it was just like yeah there is there was a brown booby today so uh so yeah, that, that pretty well uh, sums up the experience and, the, and, the, and my observation of it. That's, yeah, that's incredible. incredible. I mean, I know that standing at Van Wagner's can, you know, like 
you, you're looking, you're looking, you take a break for a minute. Someone calls something out, you try and put your eyes onto it. You're kind of following, but birds are just coming left, right, and center. They're all over the place. And uh, the fact that you that you were able to pick that up and and watched it fly in that for I mean, like, I wonder if it was there for days leading into that. But someone, no, you found it, and like, what what a what a cool honor. And the fact that you. Um, yeah, that you you were the recipient of the 2020 award. So, so where are you right now? Because you were presented, you you got a trophy. Your your mom received it. What was going? What's going on with that? Um, yeah, I, I guess. Uh, yeah, it was. Um, um, yeah, I'm I'm doing. I mean, I'm in Cambridge right now, so it's. Uh, and I'm back at school now, so I'm not. I don't have that much time to go birding. So unfortunately, I'm not finding. Uh, I'm not uh, don't have the opportunity to to go you know go all over right now and uh, but hopefully you know once fall comes back around I'll be back I'll be back uh, hopefully uh, doing some lake watching and uh, you know I think I think that's my favorite kind of birding and and that and especially uh, you know another type of birding that not a lot of people know about is uh, is morning flight um, been doing a fair bit of that down on the Lake Erie shoreline and that's always fun because you get to you know seeing birds migrating. Uh, during the day is something you don't really have the opportunity to observe. Well, at least in a landlocked county such as Cambridge, aside from, you know, um, you can see sometimes blue jays and, uh, and other uh, diurnal migrants. But, uh, but anyways, I'm not, gonna, I'm not gonna dive too much into that. But, uh, but yeah, I'm, I'm trying to get out as much as I can. But, uh, but yeah, yeah, I'm in, uh, and I'm in geological engineering right now, uh, studying in my third year at the University of Waterloo. Gotcha, yeah, because I, I was, Cheryl sent the email that she had dropped dropped the trophy off but I guess you were you're away at school so she dropped out uh, of your birding of your birding prowess yeah well they're always joking around saying uh you know it's like oh so you know what do you get for seeing that and it's always just kind of like oh you know it's like it's kind of like bragging rights and it's just it's just nice it's it, I, I just enjoy uh enjoy going out and, and seeing what I could find and uh and you know from most normal people they don't maybe they don't they don't see that but uh but you know having uh <laughs> something to show for it is uh uh at least for them it's like oh okay i see now <laughs> well yeah it's a it's a pretty neat honor so congratulations um i i forget i forget what it looks like i don't think it's a cup right like you can't you can't pour a celebratory drink into it like you can the stanley cup i guess huh no it's just uh no, but it's uh, yeah, it's a, a giant plaque, and uh, every year it has the, the, you know, the bird of the year and the uh, the individual who who found it. So it's uh, it's really neat to see, you know, how that's how that's been every year because um, I know there's a couple birds there that I've like that I've twitched and I didn't really know. I honestly didn't know about this whole award until uh, until recently. So that was uh, that was really great and. Uh, um, and, and I guess I assume every year it's, you know, I don't know, I guess it just it, you know, hand it off to whoever is the person who uh, has that big bird of the year there. So, uh, yeah. yeah. So take a picture of it. Enjoy, enjoy the moment. Enjoy the year. And um, I guess it's too early to tell what the bird of the year for 2021 will be. But uh, you're on that list forever, my friend. So congratulations. Yeah, it's an honor. And uh, and. Yeah, it's uh, it's so great to see that there's a, uh, um, you know, really strong community of birders in the in the area, and that's something that's uh, you know very transparent and comes through. So, so yeah, and I thank you for uh, yeah for having me today. Sure. Well, I'm glad you were available on such uh, late notice, but um, <laughs> perhaps perhaps this is just part of the start of of uh, you know Nathan and the and the BSG because you know. Uh, you know, just talking about what you were mentioning there about, um, what were you calling it? Morning flight? <laughs> yes. Yeah. Uh, morning flight or some people call it visible migration. You know what? That, that sounds like a future BSG meeting all into itself. So we'll have to talk down the road, Nathan. Of course. Well, sounds great. <laughs> okay. Well, good luck at school. Thanks for uh, stopping by tonight and uh, enjoy the rest of the evening. All right. Likewise. Thanks, Jackson. Cheers. All right, so award one, congratulations to Nathan. Uh, award two, and again, if you haven't had a chance to, to, to check out the latest copy of the Wood Duck, I'm, I'm sure it's available online now. 
So be sure to check that out. So um, I am going to share my screen once again. So that way we are able to check out the award for the Robert Curry Award. And this is one that's given to a youth in our community. And the video was recorded. The video, the video will show the award winner being presented with the award itself by Bob Curry. It was shot by Arlene in Arlene's backyard. It was filmed a little bit on a bit of a windy day. So keep that in mind as we watch this, but I will share this screen and we will enjoy this for the next couple of minutes. It's going now. As we were last year to present the Robert Curry Trophy, we knew that we'd be doing it the same way uh, more than a year later. Uh, and so let me give you a little background about the about the trophy and what this is all about. Uh, the Robert Curry Trophy is awarded to the to the young person under 18 who sees uh, in the Hamilton study area the greatest variety of birds in in, in, the, in the calendar year. In this case. 2020. If you look at the trophy, as you see the trophy, it's quite a, a new trophy. It's only been awarded five times, uh, but that, this is not the beginning of it all. The Ross Thompson Trophy was awarded uh, beginning in about 1950, and uh, had it was one that was like it was like the the uh, uh, Stanley Cup. It had the shields all around, and they kept adding more layers. And then it started to kind of teeter and, and become old. So our, it was Arlene's idea that we should have a new trophy and that it should be named the Robert Curry Trophy. And that created this. So, Isla. Uh, the, hem the bird study group people, not least, will want to know some background about you and how you got to this point. Uh, one of the things I often ask is, what what was the spark? You mean where about six years? Seven. Seven. Yeah. <laughs> so, how did it all start? Um, well, growing up, we spent a lot of time outdoors and it always made me very happy to... ...so to say was... When I was nine years old, I woke up one uh, April morning and heard the beautiful song of a northern cardinal singing outside my window, and I was fascinated. So we, um, we approached a neighbor, got some bird seed, bought a camera a couple months later, and from then it slowly developed into a passion um, chasing exciting birds and yeah. yeah. So where where do you chase them? Where do you, where do you go to see them? Um, really all over the place because um, I live kind of on the edge of the Hamilton City area. So I spend a lot of time birding um, locally, especially with the pandemic. One of my favorite places to bird is Arkendo Park, um, and I absolutely love like getting to know the, the birds there. In the summer, we have a, a colony of bank swallows and a pair of kingfishers nesting. So I, I love like birding locally, but also um, going to find exciting birds that have been reported all over the place, um, from like Henry Valley and Coos Paradise to Rattray Marsh and Colonel Sam Smith. Yeah. Do we have a mentor? Is there somebody who's uh, mentored you? <laughs> yes, I, I do. I've been very lucky to have Rick, Rick Ludkin as my mentor. Um, is a bird banner with the Haldeman Bird Observatory and um, after visiting there uh, as a trip like the, the whole bird banning aspect just got me hooked and um, so we kept going back and he is an incredible person who really encourages me to learn more about each and every bird um, and get experience handling birds. 
So then, then you go all the way down to uh, down to Cayuga then. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah. It's worth the trip. It's well worth the trip. <laughs> yeah. That's my. my... Think that you have supportive parents. Who yes. Are, who, <laughs> Definitely. They're like uh, hockey parents, I guess, right? Yeah. <laughs> Birding can take a lot of time. Yeah. But it's yeah. it brings brings all of us so much joy. It does. Uh, any any favorite uh, bird of your two hundred and nine? Two hundred. What does it say? It says. Oh yeah. Wow. You, oh gosh, I was uh, reviewing my list and I, I realized it's, it seems like it's so insignificant when you group it into one number, but in reality, like every single bird is such a treasure. Um, I think there were three birds that were really wow birds for me, because they were they were rare and they, were, they also took a lot of effort to try and see them. Uh, the brown booby that came down, yeah, that was yeah. that was definitely worth, <laughs> um, worth the trip. I actually ended up biking two hours to go see it. Um, yeah, and it was. I was glad to see some. I think I saw a black belly plover on the way too. So even though that was a really far off bird, um, just got a glimpse of it. That was that was a wow bird. Uh, the yellow headed blackbird also at the what's it called? Van Wagner's. Oh, that was there. That was there in the spring. Yeah. Yeah. We had about we had a thirty minute time frame to try and find it and found it the very last second and it was another wow well, moment. That's fun. Yeah, well, it was just about Yes. <laughs> yes, it was a gorgeous bird, um, and singing away and it's a very strangely croaky song. And I think the third Gosh. Yeah, yeah. Um, oh and I also really enjoyed there was uh, there were a couple local fish crows that spent oh, yeah. most of March and April flying around at my neighborhood, which was really, really yeah. special to be able to see them. Yeah, they, the they, as you know, they, they, weren't, they didn't yes. exist here at all until 10 years or so ago, and, uh, yeah. and now they're part of our other of fun. Yeah. yeah. So you're doing a lot more than you're going, you're, you're banding, you, you, you were supposed to be banding today. Yes, yeah, we were, but uh, unfortunately the, the pandemic was but I hope to continue banding when this is all over and perhaps work towards my stuff from it. That's one of the goals that I have. Oh, excellent. And, and you're also working on, or you're about to present a, a webinar on Birded Den. Tell us about that. Yeah. Uh, so I, I'm part of the Ontario Nature Youth Council, and I've been given the amazing opportunity to work with Ontario Nature to create and present an uh, intro to birding webinar. Um, now I am in no no means an expert on birds, but my my goal is to bring bring, um, bring birds and bird watching to youth um, because there are not that many young birders, and I think it's very important that we educate youth about birds to so that they appreciate nature and that they will want to protect it in the future. So um, in a week's time, uh, in a week's time, I'm going to be doing a webinar um, and teaching young. Um, young people about birds and threats to birds and also um, like ident basic identification, birding equipment, how to join the birding community. I'm very excited. Um, yeah. All, so in, all in one. Sounds like yes, it it's a, a it's a, part series. <laughs> yeah. It's definitely a challenge to fit yeah. it to, to, to touch on all the different aspects yeah. of birding, but it's been very fun to, to create it. Um, and I hope that the, that some some youth are inspired to spend more time outdoors in the end. I can hardly imagine that they won't be. Yes. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. uh, going forward, uh, do you think you might find uh, a career in, in these areas, or, or is it...? Well, um, I'm at a point in my life where everyone is trying to figure out what they're going to do. Yeah. Um, and... I... I there are so many things that interest me. I'm, I'm not really sure where, where life is going to take me, but I do know that um, I, I really enjoy learning all about the sciences, and um, I hope that, that my love for bird watching will help me make a positive difference in the world in the future. Um, and even if I don't go into ornithology or biology or ecology, uh, I know it'll always be a big part of my life, which I'm very excited for. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So I, at this point, I would, I would normally hand you the phone. Yes. <laughs> We're not going to do it quite like that. And, and in addition to that, because you, so you're able to keep this until approximately this time next year, unless you win again. Uh, uh, 
But in addition to that, we have we have something uh, something else. I think do we not, Arlene? Oh, okay. Anytime. What? Oh, oh, oh okay. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't. I didn't mean. I was forget. I was. Yeah. I've kind of forgotten whether it was a book or that it was money. I knew you were talking to Glenda about it before, but okay. So that's wow, something, something that you, you can, very much. You can uh, buy a bird book with yes. it. Yes, uh, it will definitely, yeah. Like yeah, it will definitely, most likely go to something bird watching related. Well, I, I the, 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 the bird study group is one place where this will be shown and uh, they will be impressed. Oh, thank as, you. As I must. Yeah. Well, it's. I'm. I'm just so thankful for uh, to the, the Hamilton Naturalist Club and, and to you for, for making this possible. Because honestly, as a young birder, there are not that many opportunities to to really um, accomplish something and to, to have something to show your accomplishment. And um, it, even though it's like. Even though I won, I won a trophy, I, I along the way I was able to spend so much time outdoors and see so many wonderful birds and, and meet birders and those memories. Um, I don't think I'll ever forget. So thank you so much. Okay. For the Is there anything else you'd like to say before we uh, Thank you, parents. <laughs> <laughs> I honestly I could not have done it without them. Um, yeah, all the long drives and many hours. Walking and looking and walking and looking some more. Um, I'm eternally grateful for, for your support for bird watching and bird banding. And I'm really glad that, that we're able to share this music hobby together. Yeah. Now, I don't know if Isla's actually here in the room with us tonight. Um, but that was the video that was that was made. Um, so very excited for her, for Isla O'Neill, 203 species. Um, and so she uh, is the recipient of the 2020 uh, Robert Curry Award. I know that there are some youth who are gonna be striving for that for 2021, and there's probably a couple of them in the room right now. One of them that I was trying to go for this award uh, based on his work last year, uh, Marcus Legsdens, found a little gull this evening while looking for the snowy egret. So that's an exciting find uh, if you're going to be out birding tomorrow morning. Uh, yeah, a little gull was found with some Bonaparte skulls, uh, Burloak Waterfront Park on the west side. So congratulations to Marcus, but more so congratulations to Isla uh, and any young birder out there who is who is out there doing the work and and IDing birds and enjoying this hobby. Um, I look forward to seeing who wins next year. So she also mentioned the brown booby. She cycled two hours to go see that. That's pretty impressive to see that bird. So Nathan, see what you've done. You've inspired younger birders even just by your find to, to cycle for two hours on their bicycle to find that bird. So it's, it's a bit of a domino effect. Uh, all right, so two awards given. Now, I think we're going to bring on George. We're going to bring on George Naylor here, uh, whose name is also Heather. And George is going to talk to us a little bit about a project that he's kind of taken on as a citizen. He's done this all on his own volition. And George, you can turn on your camera, you can turn on your microphone, and we can chat with you because um, you were a youth once, and you uh, have a passion for birds. And you've been able to use your time on this planet to try and do better for the birds. Now, if all else fails and you can't get your stuff on, which you should be able to, I'm just, I just asked you to unmute. You might, oh, maybe I, maybe I have to make you a co-host. Oh, I can hear you now. Okay. I have my technical crew beside me, just in Alrighty. case. <laughs> no picture yet? No picture yet, but that's all right. Sure you can, can keep working on that. Okay. How's that? Yeah, there you are. Okay. So, George, welcome. You have been taking on quite a, uh, you've called it the David and Goliath, and more, I guess it's David and Goliaths story um, when it comes to the, the protection and preservation of, of a couple of different species. And we'll talk about one at a time. 
Um, so you're a, you're a, a, a Cayuga, Caledonia guy? I live in, live in Caledonia, but born, raised in, in Hamilton. Lived in Burlington when I, until, when I sold my business and we wanted to simplify our life, so we moved to Caledonia. We've been, we've been here five years, right on the south bank of the river. Wow. Uh, must get some pretty good birding down there. Yes, we do. And so, so wh how did it go? Did you, did you just happen to notice you had some cliff swallows in your neighborhood? Did you hear about a notice first? Like, what, what was the order here? Well, no, no, actually, and again, a product of living, like I'm lo looking out through the living room window, I'm looking right at the Grand River. We're about a little over 100 feet from the shoreline. So it was a day, probably end of April, and I looked out on the river, and it was one of those gray, cool days, and there were a lot of swallows low over the river feeding in the morning. So I walked over with the binoculars to have a closer look, and I was actually the thought process was i haven't seen a cliff swallow this year so i started scanning the swallows looking for cliff swallows and i got thinking about cliff swallows and it was like a light coming on because i knew the bridge in caledonia was going to be replaced uh and i thought what happens to that colony because i knew there's a large cliff swallow colony under the bridge what happens to that colony with the new bridge so the first thing is check to see what the new bridge design is going to be now there's a website, MTO has a website for it. So I went on, it's pretty complete and it had plans. Well, the bad news was it's a steel girder bridge. There's a concrete deck, but uh, in doing some research, once, once I read this, knew that the, the new bridge was gonna be radically different than the old bridge. Uh, actually, my, my partner Rhonda found um, a study online um, published by Henderson University in, in the Arkansas Journal of Science, and they studied the effect of bridge design on cliff swallow nesting success. Well, I read this study, and I mean, it's just unequivocal. Cliff swallows don't nest on steel. They need a 90-degree concrete surface, two concrete surfaces at 90 degrees. Concrete is porous, so the mud sticks to the nest. It doesn't stick to steel. So the bridge is all steel underneath. It's got a concrete deck, but it doesn't have these 90 degree features. So once I read that, contacted the MTO, contacted the bridge study team, and you run into the, uh, the you talk about the Goliath. The Goliath is this, this attitude that we're big and we're right and we're not changing our mind. So I started pushing trying to find information out at the same time, and also trying to make this issue more well known. Well, one of the ways that I, I did it was by on the local uh, sightings uh, uh, listservs, uh, uh, birds at Google groups, HSA nature notes, and then the pipits as well, started to explain the problem and try to look for support. Well, the support started growing you mentioned a couple of people, Kaelin Bumalis, um, uh, Leanne Greaves, uh, they read my postings, uh, they contacted me, Kaelin in particular, she hooked me up with somebody at the Canadian Wildlife Service, and they have probably been the most proactive of any of the groups in terms of, they, they know this isn't right, it's not good for the cliff swallows, try to make something happen. But this is federal, provincial, you're crossing the border here in terms of jurisdiction. But uh, um, then last fall, on another one of my monthly web websites, um, Colleen Riley, the, the leader of the Pippets, contacted me, can, can I help? So her and I started conversing, and she said, well, what about a petition? Um, and I said, yeah, well, but I'm not a very technically skilled guy with computers, so what do you think? She says, well, I'll look into it, I'll do it. Well, I'd say to anybody through this whole exercise, both the swallows and the ospreys, I've never had any intention of being a one-man band. I'll take all the help I can get. So Colleen formulated the petitions. And actually, I went online and checked today, and we are just shy of 22,000 names on that petition. Now, the petition started generating interest just from people who see it online. Uh, the first thing that happened, because both Colleen and my name are on the petition, but hers was the first. People would contact her she'd forward them to me. I got, a, I got an email from Colleen about this Sean Best who was uh, made YouTube birding videos and he wanted to 
investigate the story. Well, she forwarded it to me, I contacted him, and it turned out that he was in Caledonia, he was actually kind of scoping out the situation, and he left a phone number in his email. So I called him. I said, well, if you're in Caledonia, why don't we meet? So we did, and he interviewed me. And I thought it went pretty well, but this was kind of after the fact I'd go home and say, the, 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 the YouTube uh, link is called The Birding Bros. And Sean is a fairly young guy, probably mid-30s. So I, I came back home and I'm thinking, I thought that pre went pretty well, but maybe I should check them out. So I looked at a couple of vi videos of theirs and they're kind of lighthearted. And, you know, considering the age, I'm thinking to myself, is this a bit like, you know, the McKenzie brothers meet, get interested in birds? But he sent me a copy of it, and I don't know if you saw it, Jackson, but I mean, I thought it was done pretty well, and the guy put some work into it. In fact, when he did the production and pieced it together, he had a tie on, which he definitely didn't have when I met him. So there was that. And the other thing significant that happened is I got contacted by Desmond Brown, the CBC reporter, and uh, he was interested in the this, in this story, and it showed up on, on CBC's uh, uh, email news forum. And again, that stirred up a lot of interest. The one thing I found through this whole experience is that you, me as an individual, calling an I or a small group of people don't attract as near as much attention as somebody like a CBC reporter. He contacts MTO and the MTO, he talks to somebody who's in their media department. She commented about it and said that the MTO isn't planning on any design changes, but then went on to say that there are bridges in Ontario of the same design where cliff swallows are nesting. Well, that's just simply not true. The Cayuga Bridge downstream is the same design and there are no cliff swallows on it. I mean, even talking to a neighbor who lived there said, that, you know, the old bridge had tons of swallows and they're not there now. So this business of running into the store. I, I, I'm liking this to pushing a big rock uphill. You know, you got to keep pushing. If you don't, it, it stops and maybe starts rolling back on you. Um, but yeah, attracting their attention and getting them to pay attention. Now, on the surface, you'd say a 22,000 name. And this uh, petition was forwarded to the MTO's bridge replacement team. So they're aware of every signature on it. The other thing I tried to do was make sure that Haldeman County is well represented. I mean, it, 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 it kind of takes your legs out from underneath you in the fight if there's voices from all over, but Haldeman County is silent on, on the subject. So that's something I've always, and as a result of that, there was a story printed in the Haldeman Press that did the same thing. But continually, you run into this business of, and, and I've actually experienced this with politicians that I've talked to, who will say, oh, the MTO knows what they're doing, just let them do their job, they, they'll take care of this. Well, every indication is this is not getting taken care of. I quoted the Significant Wildlife Habitat Guide, which is an Ontario publication. And it says in that guide that uh, Cliff Swallow Colony of S eight and S or more is considered significant and must be protected. That's the language of the guy. Well, I was operating on that assumption for about eight months. And then somebody responded to one of my monthly updates and said, oh, they changed that regulation. And what the, 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 the ministry did was exempted it for bridges and structures of that kind. So basically the MTO built in their, their own loophole to basically violate, let's call it the rules that most of the rest of us have to live by. So that's one of the frustrating parts. Now, I know we, we want to try to talk about both things. The ospreys, when you say Goliath, there are twins, they are twins in this case, because the telecommunications industry, I mean, there's more than one player, but Bell is certainly the biggest, particularly in our area. Well, the same thing happened, I started, posting this stuff, it got noticed. Uh, somebody from Dundas contacted the Dundas Star and they published a story, two stories actually, about the, uh, the uh, cell tower behind Olympic uh, uh, Arena on Olympic Drive in Dundas. 
Ospreys were in the business, uh, were actually building a nest and Bell maintenance work, workers came along and destroyed the nest. So that made the paper. And then coincidentally, I wrote a, a story for the Hamilton Spectator that was published in the, uh, the Reader's Right column about the Osprey issue. Well, we ended up getting in contact with Bell. Bell contacted the paper and I got the information from the reporter from the Dundas Star and we got in communication with Bell, which ended up, we had a meeting with, actually Rob Dobas and I had a um, 45 minute conference call with Bell's Office of Corporate Responsibility. Um, it, it went pretty well. It, they were pretty kind of stiff and, and not uh, very open at the start of the meeting, but I think they both pretty quickly realized that Rob and I are both pretty practical people and are, are looking for an honest solution. Um, so at the end of the meeting, they said, okay, well, we, we hear your concerns. Let us look into it. But warned us that it's a big company. A problem, okay? So it went that way, and I was looking into other options. Like one, Rob said right from the get-go is that one of the alternatives is look for um, ways of erecting uh, standalone osprey platforms, like on in Christie Conservation Area on Middletown Road. Well, I contacted the city. Uh, and contacted uh, Hydro One about the possibility of putting a nest in Bayfront Park because there was a cell tower just on the south border of Bayfront Park yep. that was formerly an active osprey nest and now there's one of these exclusion devices on it, no ospreys. Well, it turns out that Hydro One couldn't help because uh, the hydroelectric supplier for Hamilton is Electra. So I've been in communication with both them and the Hamilton Parks Department. Um, and uh, it looked like we were maybe gonna make something like that happen. And I'm, I'm not saying that it won't happen, but a, a while ago I had a communication with the head of the Parks Department and she said, they don't really think Bayfront Park is suitable because it's landfill. Well, if you've been in Bayfront Park, I mean, there's light poles, there's infrastructure there. So it's one of those that doesn't pass the smell test about why a pole adjacent to water with a, with a platform on top for ospreys. Now, I think we have to kind of be our own devil's advocate here and say, these are extraordinary times sure. because of COVID and budget issues. Like, sure. you know, uh, Every level of government is hurting as far as revenue is concerned. So it's one of those things where I don't think you can make final judgment about what can or will happen. Yeah. But I did get um, in, in the spring, I did get a reply from Bell that they decided what they were going to do moving forward. And they had promised that they were going to take down the exclusion devices from the cell towers, the type they're using now, these Christmas tree design. Um, and they further promised that they would not interfere with any active nests, but they were going to try a passive decoy to uh, deter ospreys from nesting. So it's still a, an ex exclusion attempt. It's just something different. The only problem uh, is, yeah. and, go ahead. No, the only problem is, is that as far as I know, there has not been any, any activity in terms of taking any, any of the exclusion devices down on any of the towers in an, the Helm area that were formerly active nests. I mean, to me, that's where you would start first, but that's my side of the, of the, of the question. Sure. And I guess with Atlas three occurring right now that you were even saying in our chat last week that Ospreys don't typically nest in trees. You've only known one one time for that to have ever happened. So that may, who knows where they'll well the build their nests. I mean, wildlife are pretty uh, adaptable and pretty resilient when it comes to things. But there were two two things that I worry about, and one is that I think um, 
cell, t uh, cell towers are an attractive nest site for ospreys because in urban areas, they probably equate the height to more safety. The height certainly doesn't seem to bother them. The other issue is that m there maybe aren't the natural sources of nests, like tall trees, those broken tops and stuff like that. One of, one of my other concerns, and I, there's obviously no data for this, but I wonder if it's possible that ospreys could actually lose the instinct to nest in trees if a few generations of ospreys are nest are, are, are raised and and are uh, their only experience is, is cell towers. Now, um, we got to wrap up here soon yep. to make way for the next two chats. Debbie yep. wants to know why why does Bell not want the ospreys nesting on their towers? There's probably a couple of reasons for that. If you want to quickly share that before we wrap well, they, up. They'll talk about maintenance issues, okay? And the, the, the safety of their maintenance crews. Those are the two uh, questions that um, immediately, uh, the, those are the answers that you get is that it's a maintenance issue and the safety of the workers who have to work on towers. Um, I guess it's one of those unprovable things. One obviously would be they're concerned about service. If a tower goes down, if they lose a tower, you know, that disrupts service and, you know, that makes people mad. So I'm not, I wouldn't completely discount the problem, but I still think there are alternatives even where you could use the towers and come up with um, a platform bolted beside it. But again, it's, it's difficult to convince them that uh, there's a, a way other than their way to get something like this done. In, in closing, Jackson, let me just say, I know time is an issue. I think the key to making stuff like this happen is uh, having organizations involved with some clout to push this matter. I think it's tough for individuals. I'll, I'm going to keep battling away at this thing. But um, Chris Motherwell knows of this, but um, I recently put in, an, 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 actually Lynn Folks suggested it to me in an email, the David Suzuki Foundation has a contest uh, in Ontario for groups and organizations that are doing wildlife preservation pro projects uh, and, and natural spaces uh, work. So I entered the contest and because it's for groups, I said that the Hamilton Naturalist Club would be the administrator of it. And there's a $5,000 prize. But most importantly, to me, would be if an organization like the David Suzuki Foundation got on board with a project like, like this and started to push the buttons. Because if you think about it, Bell responded to news uh, articles in uh, papers. Uh, the MTO responded to CBC report. So it seems to me that, that that's where the pressure has to, has to come from. The individual, like 22,000 names is not an insig insignificant number in a petition, but so far there hasn't been any movement. Now, the only good news to finish up on the swallows is that there was a notice that came out that said they delayed the project uh, until 2023. So it's been delayed a year. Now, I guess I could pat myself on the back and say, maybe I had something to do with that. But I also can't kid myself that this isn't just the COVID related, budget related, where, you know, it's, it's just not going to be convenient for them to do the project in the time frame that they, that they spelled out. So and maybe that, maybe that could help bide some more time yeah. to, to, to keep pushing this agenda forward. Who One knows? very last thing, like because Hamilton recently passed the biodiversity action plan, like to me, if the, ospreys in particular, like a nesting platform in Bayfront Park. And you don't have to be a birder to be awed and impressed by a close-up view of an osprey and all the people that use Bayfront Park, that that wouldn't be a win-win for the city and for anybody that goes in that park. In fact, it might encourage use of the park sure. if that became known. Yeah. So, very, very good point. you know, what speaks more to biodiversity than to do something like that, you know? Ospreys come back from DDT, 
And what we've just done is thrown another another curveball at them, another man-made curveball. So, well, George, um, on behalf of the club and 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 birds alike, thank you for thank you for caring. Thank you for just taking the time to to do what you've been doing. Um, and I wish you luck in this coming up year. Well, I th I think you know that I've until recently was pretty involved in in hockey, and in hockey we'd often say. You know, there's a big difference between talking a good game and playing a good game. Playing a game, good game requires action. You, you know, you got to do something. And it's just, I'm hard, I'm hardwired that way. And I'll just keep going. I, I'm pushing the rock uphill and it might roll backwards and get me at some point, but I'll, I'll keep pushing as long as I can. Just use your hockey stick to wedge the rock in every That's once in a while. That's it. Yeah. All right, George. Well, thank, thank you so you. much. Um, and we'll catch up with you next year. And we'll, we'll, we'll hear what uh, good work you've been this up is, to. This is ongoing. All righty. Thank you very much, sir. Yep. All righty. So um, from, from George and Cliff Swallows to Marshes and Marsh Wrens, we're going to flip over to Dave Moffitt, who is going to – let us know about kind of like an impromptu project that he has been working on. So Dave, if you want to turn your microphone and your camera I think, on. I George, think my mic, my mic's on, but uh, the host has to allow me to show my video. You know what? That's me. So <laughs> let me just find you here. I'll make you a co-host. George, you can turn your camera off if you wanted to. Um, I think you just did. So I'll turn my camera off, Dave, because I know that you've got a, 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 an actual presentation. Sure, yeah. Um, okay. And then we'll follow up with Krista to talk about Falcon Watch when you're done. So I'll turn my stuff off. You can take it away and uh, have some fun. Okay, thanks very much. Uh, let's see if I can, come on, you gotta come up there. There we go. Um, I'm Dave Moffat. I'm a, uh, former researcher and a retired biology teacher. I've had a long interest in uh, birds, but primarily in, uh, I hope that's coming. There we go. Um, Dave, uh, sorry, Dave, you're, you're, not, you're not sharing your screen yet. I think you still have to click share. Oh, okay, thought I did, okay. Let's see if I can. There's probably, that, there's probably that little thing in the bottom corner. I think you and I figured that out last week. There's just one last step you gotta hit, I think. Okay. See if I can get back to my, uh, I'm gonna have to stop this show. Oh, there we go. Hmm. Okay. Okay, there was a little, I, I hit the share, whoops, I hit the share screen, but. Uh, yeah, when you click share screen, and then in the bottom right, there's a blue button that says share. So once you put your okay. cursor and select your presentation, go to the bottom corner and click share, and it should look Okay, up. okay, there we go. There we go. Uh, thank you. Okay. All right. Um, uh, you know, I've, I've always been interested in the environment uh, since back before it was even cool, um, uh, and uh, sustainability. Uh, uh, but my recreational passage is to get out birding um, and to get out canoeing, hiking, whatever I can. Um, uh, uh, during my uh, canoeing on Coos Paradise, I uh, was often quite pleasantly surprised by the uh, number of marsh wrens I'd hear singing, even way back in the 80s when there wasn't that much marsh left. Um, uh, and so when Rob Porter started uh, the Dundas Valley IBA counts uh, a few years ago, I volunteered to cover the parts of coops that are not accessible from land trails in the RBG uh, to give better coverage. And um, coincidentally, of course, this also forced me into uh, uh, eBird. And uh, of course, as soon as I started reporting numbers of marsh wrens in the 20s or 30s or 40s, I got the dreaded um, unexpected number or date alert. Um, I had to justify it and it has never gone away. It's always um, challenged anytime I report a large number of marsh wrens. 
Um, so I thought, uh, when I get the chance, I'm going to go out there and actually measure the population uh, formally. Um, and uh, uh, I've actually approached possibly some of you to say, you know, you want to come out at five in the morning and count wrens? Um, uh, but when the pandemic provided an opportunity last June, when um, the province allowed open spaces to be opened up again, but still had travel restrictions, I thought perfect time to do this study I'd been putting off. Um, after all, you cannot get much more socially distanced than solo canoeing. So um, I knew a lot of the marshes in, in Coots, uh, and I knew where the wrens were. Uh, so there are lots of wrens in uh, Mac Landing and the marsh east of East Pond. Um, those are old marshes. They've been around since Coots Paradise um, uh, became uh, a thing. Um, much of the marsh has been lost there. Um, but I found uh, along Sydenham, or sorry, yeah, along Sydenham Creek, uh, the marshes have come back after Project Paradise started. Same along Boar's Creek, um, and uh, up here in the uh, Bulls Point marshes, they've expanded a fair bit since Project Paradise started. Um, and then there are other areas like, uh, um, oops, lost my cursor there, there we go, it's running around. Doesn't want to come down though. Okay, yeah, down here around the Desjardins Canal, these marshes have been, um, restored by the RBG staff and have actually uh, uh, become much larger than they were 30, 40 years ago. Um, and now they're working to extend them down along the uh, uh, Sydenham Creek channel uh, out here. Um, but these are all marshes where I had heard marsh wrens. And so I focused on them, but I also checked out a bunch of other marshes uh, down here in the Westdale Cut. Um, uh, double Marsh on Sassafras Point. Um, uh, there are a few others, um, and uh, there are marshes up around uh, the Hydro Pond as well. Uh, um, so, uh, if anybody was looking at that map, you will have noticed that almost all of my marshes are in the end of the RBG where there are very few hiking trails. Uh, so, an average birder might be lucky to go out and have a two or four marsh wrens if they went out the marsh boardwalk or uh, the Sydenham, uh, uh, Sydenham Creek Trail. Um, but I took the chance last summer to go out and get a, a systematic count of all singing males at the peak of breeding season. On four mornings between June 5th and July 14th, I started at sunrise, which is around 5.30 at that time of year. And I paddled a circuit between 10 and 12 kilometers, depending on the winds and, and uh, um, what trajectory I had to take uh, to count the wrens in all of these marshes. Um, I, I would typically finish around 10.30 or, or 11 uh, because wren songs started to decline. Marsh wrens are edge species. They, marsh, they, they, they nest in cattail edge habitat, and they nest in small clusters of territories. Um, often they're referred to as being semi-colonial. It's a bit of a misnomer. They're extremely vicious to each other, um, uh, but they're so habitat selective that they end up in very small, very intensely defended territories. Um, uh, so it, they appear to be, um, they, they are clustered, they appear to be colonial. Um, now, we've got to, <laughs> I'm going to just take that. Hmm, okay, I'm going to try to move that box. I don't know whether that's covering that for everybody else, but okay. Uh, males sing from pre-dawn to dusk. Um, peaking between sunrise and about uh, late mid to late morning. Um, and then they sing again from late afternoon to uh, um, evening, uh, peaking before sunset, but they will even sing in the middle of the night. Um, uh, and uh, 
you know, uh, you can go out and hear them at almost any time during this couple of months of uh, mid breeding season. Um, neighboring males will counter sing, i.e. one bird sings a song, its immediate neighbor um, sings immediately after it does, um, and they will um, song match and song switch as a sort of ritualized competition. Uh, they have huge repertoires of song. Um, here in the East, a typical male will have 20 to 30 songs that are distinguishable. Um, the Western subspecies, many males will have over 100 uh, differentiated songs. Um, so what will happen is one male will sing, its neighbor will sing often within a second or two, um, uh, and they will keep on going, counter singing at five to 10 second intervals. Um, and then one of the birds will song switch and go to one of its other calls. And within one or two rounds, the other bird will switch and try to come up with a song as, as close to the one the first bird is singing. Um, so uh, I'm going to try a little test here. Um, uh, make sure your sound is up. Um, and I'm going to play a little clip of Marsh Wrens. I'll get the volume up here. Whoops. Now see as this as this loops. See how um, see how many birds you think you can hear. Dave, I think you advanced the screen. Um, there's that okay. one little function in your share right. screen at the top right. Remember to uh, share your sound. Okay. Right. Okay. Um, okay. It says stop the share. Okay. Maybe I can get the the three little buttons. The three little yeah. Yep. Yeah. Scroll down to share sound. Okay. Here we go. That should that should work. And we'll go. Now you can listen. Um, obviously, it's a lot easier um, in uh, real life where you have stereophonic sound um, and you can triangulate a little bit. Um, I can detect at least four marsh wrens singing in that clip. Um, and I think there's a fifth, but I wouldn't be sure um, if I weren't uh, um, out there cross checking it. Um, uh, so I used a very conservative method of counting. Um, I, I got the minimum number of territorial males I could distinguish in each marsh that I surveyed. And I counted as a singing bird, obviously if it sang alone, if it sang simultaneously with one or more nearby birds, i.e. their songs overlapped and therefore they had to be two birds. Uh, if it sang antiphonally um, or you know, counter sang with one or more other birds while each maintained its singing position, so you could see the clear back and forth between the locations of the two birds. Um, or if it was too geographically remote from the other birds that had already counted in that marsh to be the same bird. Um, so, from a position on the edge of the marsh, I might think I could hear as many as six marsh wrens, but in this case, uh, the two on the uh, left are fairly close together as far as the angle from my canoe and a fairly similar distance apart. The two on the, oops, I'll go back there. The two on the right, ah, cursor's acting up, okay, are, they appear to be at different distances from me, but they're at exactly the same angle from the canoe. So what I do is then I try, okay, I triangulate um, from a new position. And in this case, now, the two birds on the right are clearly distinct. They're, they're different birds. The two on the left, a little bit iffier because they're still at a very similar angle from me, 
and at a similar distance from me. So I would count five in this case to be conservative, unless the two on the left gave me clear indications. They sang overlapping um, something, and then I'd count six. The first day I went out, I just did a scouting report, and I kept a tally of all the runs I, I could uh, count. Uh, I also scouted out a number of the other potential nesting areas. Um, so it took me a little longer, and I didn't have time to go up Borer Creek, up to the hydro pond. Um, uh, and I tallied 31 wrens singing on that first day. On the next three counts, I took an individual count from each of these uh, marshes and uh, um, was much more, you know, much more detailed uh, record keeping. Um, this is the data I, I got from the, uh, the first general tally, 31 birds. But on June 16th, July 3rd, and July 14th, I came up with 37, 38, and 43 birds singing. Um, and if you notice on any given row, the number of birds heard singing in any one of these marshes was remarkably similar. It typically didn't vary by more than one or two birds. The one difference was here, uh, East Pond on, July, on June 16th, um, I only heard three birds. Now, I knew that East Pond was a, uh, um, a rich area for marsh wrens. Um, I also knew that as I approached in the canoe, I saw a Cooper's Hawk um, uh, patrolling the shoreline near there. And just before I got there, a red-tailed hawk um, went low over the marsh. So in that case, I'm pretty confident that there were a lot of silent birds um, that day. So conservatively, on the last day, I can say there were at least 43 different singing males in the marshes in Coots Paradise. Um, if I were to take the maximum number of singing males heard at any one marsh and add those together, my tally was 47 territories in this area, uh, which is, you know, didn't surprise me, but it's quite remarkable. Now my count was conservative. There were birds that I thought might be real birds, but uh, couldn't be sure I was distinguishing them from others. Um, there were areas of suitable habitat that I couldn't access. There's seasonal and permanent restrictions on a few areas of suitable habitat. Um, so the true territorial count is likely in excess of 50 territories, um, at least in the summer of 2020. Since males are somewhat polygynous, in the East, uh, people estimate anywhere from 1.1 to 1.3 females per male, um, uh, per territorial male. And there are non-territorial bachelor males known to exist in this species. That would mean that the adult summer population of the marsh would exceed 100 birds. But my conclusions from this, three, three conclusions that I drew. First is, uh, the breeding population of marsh wrens in Coos Paradise is among the largest recorded in South Central Ontario. There aren't very many good big marshes left in South Central Ontario. Um, and it should be recognized as regionally or provincially significant for this species. Um, secondly, since roughly half of the observed territorial males occupied marshes that have either recovered on their own or have been restored since the inception of Project Paradise by the RBG, the species should be recognized as a signature species of the restoration efforts. It's a common species that is undoubtedly much more common because of the, the effort going in to restore the marsh. Um, and since there are areas of cattails that I checked out this year, last year, that did not have singing males, yet looked at least reasonable to my eye, um, there were areas of where recent flooding in 2019 had severely degraded restored marsh, so it was unavailable, and there are areas still slated for further cattail planting. planting. Continued monitoring should be carried out. Um, based on my data with this method, you could do a reasonable census, um, reasonably reliable census of the number of territories in two mornings, three at most, 
Um, and you could use it as a gauge of how the cattail restoration is progressing and, uh, and, and, and setbacks like the floods, what, what effect they have. So a dry winter has seen a dramatic drop in uh, water levels. It's exposed mudflats. It allows oxygen and light to reach the sediments. It's reduced carp access um, and other uh, invasive species access. And it's created the conditions this summer for further planting on some of the uh, mud flats and shallow water uh, that's been revealed. And so this all looks good for the, uh, the restoration. Um, I would like to see um, the marsh wrens become a good index of that restoration um, over the next few years. And I do hope that in 20 years, when I bring my grown grandsons back to Coot's Paradise, I'll be able to count 70 or 80 singing marsh wrens over top of the sounds of least bitterns, common gallinules, pied greaves, soras, Virginia rails, and sandhill cranes, and maybe even breeding black terns. Okay, all I have to do is get them up in time to hit the water by 5.30 in the morning. Although my wife also pointed out, all I also have to do is be alive in 20 years. Uh, <laughs> um, Okay, so uh, I hope that anybody who is out on coots, um, especially anybody who uses eBirds, um, will uh, report them, uh, count them as well as you can and report them. I'd like to establish numbers like this coming from a number of different observers because they think I'm just a kook who reports marsh wrens every time I pick up a paddle. Um, uh, establish the fact that it is a very significant population. Um, and uh, I hope it also encourages people just to get out there and enjoy Coots Paradise. Well, that's incredible. Thanks so much, Dave. Uh, I, I've, I posted in the chat, if anyone has any questions to put them in there, and there, there aren't any necessarily, okay. but I, I, I have one to, to close off your portion before we go and, and hear about the Falcon Watch, which is, um, have you reached out to RBG with this information? Um, have you shared Have you shared your data with them? And, and if so, what has their response been? Um, <laughs> uh, I've uh, approached Tice with it and uh, sent it to a couple of other people. Um, uh, Tice's response was that they're aware of the marsh wrens. They're aware of the numbers. They're not aware that there's a large population. Um, that he at one point had actually pitched it, um, but he hadn't pursued it because there wasn't much enthusiasm uh, at higher levels. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I, I wanted, one of the reasons I wanted to do this talk was get it out there and uh, I'll, uh, um, I'll keep trying. Uh, one person has asked, do you depend on sightings in your studies? So you were talking about vocalizations mostly. Um, with the uh, for, most of the singing by marsh wrens is done below the top of the cattails, um, and I don't know if you if if people have been out on uh, coots uh, you know, on the water. Uh, in most areas now, the cattail uh, wall has become pretty impressive. As you go down Sydenham Creek, uh, it's eight feet above you. Uh, so. Um, I try to see them, but the birds reveal themselves by sound. Um, and occasionally they will accidentally reveal themselves um, to you. But actually uh, the shots I got were, were from there, but most of them, if anybody's watching carefully, were clearly uh, females or juveniles. Uh, they hop around getting fed and bring attention to themselves at times. The males will hop up, give a song and gone. <laughs> um, but uh, um, uh, so I, short of taking a drone up, I'm not sure how you'd get a really good visual account. <laughs> this person is also going to get to get a decent look and no photo. So um, I wish you luck, owner, whoever you are. That's their name as, the, as I'm seeing it now. And Dave, uh, any last messages before we depart and move on to, to our next talk? Uh, no, but I'll be out there again this summer. So uh, if you're if you're out at five thirty, look for me.
I'll tell you what, it is heaven out there as the sun rises. Um, uh, the beavers, the mink, the muskrats, the deer don't give a damn that you're there at that time of morning. <laughs> so, um, uh, you know, it is really delightful, but it's well, a little sleep, sleep depriving. So. Sure. I think you invited me out on, a, on an early morning, John. <laughs> Yeah, I remember seeing 5.30 when my kids were babies, and I was yes, like, I don't, yeah. I don't need to get up at that time. I don't know if I will. <laughs> but uh, I, I, one of these days, I'll join you, and I'll look forward to hearing of your stories through the Google groups as you share them. Maybe okay. even a future Wood Duck article. But uh, thanks for joining us tonight, Dave. Okay. Thanks. Yeah, we'll talk again soon. Now, to keep going, because it is 9 o'clock, um, we'll invite Krista to join us now because she wants to let us know what's happening with the Falcon Watch, which if anyone's been keeping uh, any tabs on what's going on with Falcon Watch, there's been a change in the, um, in the, in the family members going on there right now. Um, the, 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 the male has been... Um, has been unseated he's been dethroned and there's a new there's a new male on the scene so so krista there you are um thanks for joining us tonight i know you also have a powerpoint presentation so i'll i'll, I'll, I'll stop my screen and you can just kind of take it away and we'll hear from you and we'll hopefully end around 9 30 at the latest for those of us who are still here um which I, no, no one's actually left we still have everyone who's who joined so that's great so krista how are you uh let us know what's going on with you I'm good, thank you. How are you? Just dandy, actually. <laughs> we've, um, as you mentioned, we've uh, had a lot of entertainment and um, on the edge of our seats watching what's going on with the Falcons. It's always an exciting year, um, time of year for us, but uh, as you said, with the addition of the new mail, it's changed things up a lot. So I'm going to try and uh, do the screen share here, so bear with me. Can, are you able to see this or not? You've stopped sharing your own video screen. Um, so there you are. Oh, you did it again. Okay. Um, are you able to just pull up the PowerPoint? Because it's not coming up for me. Let's see. didn't uh, open it and save it anywhere. Okay. Uh, okay, here it is. I think I might need to download it. So just give me a sec while it does that. Um, all right, it's opening. All right, so I think we should be good. Can you see that? I can see that. That's perfect. Okay, so uh, this presentation is about the Hamilton Falcon Watch, and I am Krista Jackson. Um, I've been with Falcon Watch for a few years now on the committee, as well as participating with the Beat on the Street. Uh, when Mike Street moved to Ottawa, I uh, helped uh, Pat Baker with organizing it. And we'll just go to the next slide. I just pulled some interesting facts about peregrine falcons. Uh, the scientific name, the falco peregrinus, um, you might not know, it actually means the wandering falcon. The peregrine falcon is at the top of the food chain, which is quite evident when we see them around Hamilton. They're found on all continents except Antarctica, and they can migrate up to 15,500 miles per year. Historically, they were called the duck hawk. They have an extra eyelid that is partially translucent, which allows them to reach the diving speeds of up to 390 kilometers an hour, and they are the fastest creatures on the planet. Their conservation status has now been upgraded to least concerned, uh, which is great. There's a huge um, impact with Falcon Watch in creating this status for them. 
Uh, their eyesight is estimated to be eight times better than humans, which allows them to see prey up to three kilometers away. For banding, uh, there are a number of reasons that we do this. The first one is a health check. For example, when uh, they're looking at the chicks, they um, look at their tongues. When they're first taken from the nest, these tongues will be pink, but with the stress of the situation, the ends will turn white. And this shows that there's proper neurological functioning with the chicks. Uh, this helps because, for example, in 2007, Bluefoot was found to have an infection and he was able to be treated and then was returned to the nest and he was fledged successfully that year. Without the banding, he may have died like two of the other chicks that year did that had died in, I believe it was the first week. Tracking is another reason for doing this. Banding is the cheapest and the easiest, but is also the most effective way to track the birds through their mi migration and dispersal during their lives. It helps us to track their mortality rate and gives data on the causes of death. Um, examples, we have uh, Peter, who is now in Toronto. He was fledged in 2012, and he actually had one year in 2010 when his mate was injured and he was left to raise uh, the two chicks he had alone. Piggett was um, from 2011. He was the, uh, his parents were Madam X and Serge. He's nesting in Syracuse, New York, and he actually had two chicks this year. Durand was from 2009. Again, he had the same parents and he's resides in Columbus, Ohio. He again, uh, sorry, she again has had chicks and she is on the Columbus Peregrine um, blog, if people are interested to follow as well. Felker was from 2018 and is nesting in Buffalo. There is a webcam at that location. And interestingly enough, Felker is the parent of the falcon that has evaded, um, invaded the territory this spring. Uh, Lawrence is another one that we were able to track. Unfortunately, we found out late last year that he has died. He was born in 2018 and Lily and Ozzy were his parents. Uh, the last thing that the band does is it provides protection for the falcons. Uh, Canadian falcons, when they fly to the States during migration or if they end up moving there, which a few of ours have, um, it, they are legally protected from trapping and harvesting. There's 21 states that do permit this to happen. However, because of the, the laws, they have worked that the Canadian peregrines will not be allowed to be trapped. So if they're accidentally caught, they must be released. The bans for Canada are black. So this is the 27th year of the Falcon Watch. The falcons that we've seen um, first came in 1994 and they began nesting on the roof of the Sheridan Hotel. Since then, we have had 60 chicks hatch from here and we've had another four chicks that were planted. This happened in two different years when some of the eggs or all of the eggs failed and the parents uh, fostered these chicks and raised them as their own and they successfully fledged as well. Madam X has the longest reign to date. She was hatched in 1999 and arrived in Hamilton in 2001. She mated with Percy and remained um, in Hamilton for 14 years. She had four different mates during that time and fledged 43 different chicks. It wasn't until 2015 when she disappeared following an injury to her foot. And that is when we had Lily begin to nest. So Ozzy was hatched in 2012. He is the current male of the nest. Um, he was from Etobicoke. He came into Hamilton in 2015 after the death of Serge. And the same year is when Lily arrived. Now Ozzy is the one that may not be with us much longer. We're still waiting to find out what's gonna go on with Ozzy. Lily, uh, she's the resident female and she's been here for the last six nesting seasons. She was hatched in 2010 from Michigan. 
She's been uh, watched in her incubating her eggs in the sunshine, the rain, and the snow. She's given us some great uh, pictures from the webcam of her dedication for the eggs. Lily does the majority of the incubating while Ozzy will bring her the meals and take over to give her a little break. Um, one of the largest parts of Falcon Watch is the Feed on the Street. It is a volunteer-based program. The shifts go from 8 a.m. to 9 p.m. seven days a week. The shifts are usually broken up into two-hour increments. There are coordinators as well. It is a paid summer job and they organize the volunteers and usually work Monday to Friday. They also uh, partake in documenting what has happened, how often the chicks are um, fed, and when they start flying, stuff like that, so we can track their development. Uh, we do try to keep the coordinators as hired students, although it is open to anyone. So um, whenever it comes up, if you know somebody that is interested, we would be more than happy to hear about them. And uh, one of the main reasons for the feed in the street is because it's an urban area, we have to worry about the chicks coming to ground or if they get stuck somewhere and need to be rescued. We have volunteers that are trained um, in order to be able to rescue them. And if there's any problems and they need medical attention, they usually do go to uh, the Owl Foundation in Vineland in order to get rehabilitated and they will be released um, whenever they can. So this past year, we had two chicks hatch. Uh, the one was Griffin, and I started with him. He was the second born, but he is a success story for us. Um, he was the first one to actually fledge off the, uh, the shelf, but we were, it's a little undecided on whether he actually intended to fly that day or if he had been flapping his wings and got pushed off by a gust of wind because it was a pretty windy day. Um, he had some good flights in the beginning, but he did uh, collide with a building and we did have to rescue him and he was taken to the Owl Foundation for rehabilitation. He had some bruising, but no major damage and he was kept uh, for about a week and that was just more as a precaution and to give him time to rebuild his strength. When we released him, he took a direct flight from the top of the Sheridan to the new building, the Marquis, and it was a taller building. So it was, he went up and he showed a really strong flight. So it was really good to see. Um, we had some two days tracking him and uh, White, her and his sister. Uh, unfortunately, Griffin did disappear and the Falcon Watch was unable to locate him again after that. However, it was in December that we got photo identification where he had been found in uh, the shores or on the shores of Lake Ontario. So we did get confirmation that he did in fact just leave the nest and he was in good health. We haven't heard any more about him since, but no news is sometimes really good news. White Hearn was the other chick that we had. She was the four first born of 2020. She was an extremely strong flyer right from the get-go. Um, during the watch, we were able to see her doing talon touching with Lily numerous times. She showed a very brazen attitude and was not afraid of anything. Uh, there were numerous occasions when we were able to see her chasing off larger birds. And she was um, also seen playing with juvenile raptors. It was pretty high up in the air, so they weren't able to do a positive idea of what raptors they were playing with, but it was a, a very nice, good treat for the people that were on duty that day. Nesting time. So as most people are aware, the nesting usually become, starts in March and April. And each year, this is, we'll see Lily start preparing the scrape. Uh, this year, she started on the west side, which she has done before. And um, a lot of the people that watch the camera get all excited because we have a clear view of the scrape here. However, at the last minute, she decided to return to the east side when the ledge actually blocks part of the view. And that is where she nested again this year. It wasn't until uh, later that we found 
that she did have an egg. She began incubating on March 31st, but it was April 5th that we had our first peak of the, at the egg. We knew that she had eggs, but it's always exciting to see the visual confirmation. Uh, at this point, we weren't sure how many eggs she has as the ledge does block it, but we did know at least one. A typical clutch size is three to four eggs and Lily has been doing four most years. Um, they do sometimes fail, uh, like last year, two of the four eggs did fail. The incubation period for the peregrine falcon eggs is typically 33 to 35 days. The average in Hamilton is a little longer at 38 days. We did expect that the uh, eggs would hatch in around May 7th of this year. Unfortunately, that's when the drama started. So this year, when we were looking to get started, we had a third adult fly into the area. He has been named as um, Judson, and he was from Buffalo, as I mentioned. He's actually Felker's um, offspring, and Felker is from Madam X and Serge. So one of um, there was witnessing of a battle between Ozzy and Judson and Ozzy did disappear for a little while and Judson was seen on the different um, areas near the ledge um, where the nest is, but it did take him a little while and we have seen him on the ledge with Lily. However, uh, the eggs did fail. Um, we waited until the 15th and that was long past the uh, time that they would hatch. So sadly, it doesn't look like we will have eggs. Although there is a possibility that um, Judson may look at mating with Lily and she could try a second clutch. She hasn't done this before, but it is not unheard of for the peregrine falcons. Uh, Lily and Ozzy have had failed eggs before, so it's not uncommon. So we don't know if the fail is from just the way things are or if it had to do with Judson coming into the territory and creating more stress in the atmosphere. Um, we have been looking and we're pretty sure we have seen Ozzy still around. Uh, some of his favorite haunts, we do look and it looks like he's there, unfortunately. Uh, it's been hard to try and see the ID band. As you can see in the picture here, this one is Judson's band, but when you're looking for binoculars, it can be very hard trying to find it, especially if they're flying. Uh, but we do believe Ozzy's still in the area, Lily is still in the area, and so is Judson, and there is uh, sightings of a fourth falcon in the downtown area. Uh, they were flying away at the time and again they were not able to determine what the band is to be able to find out who this falcon is. It may be another female or it could be another male. We don't know at this point. Um, we do update things on the Hamilton Community Peregrine Falcon page so you can keep an eye out there if we find out more information on who this fourth falcon is we will be posting it there. Um, just to let people know, we're always looking for volunteers. There's a number of ways to volunteer. Um, for example, we do have the Falcon Watch Committee and we have the Feet in the Street, which is one of my favorite parts. Uh, lots of action, especially if you um, come in the early mornings, you get the first flights and the feedings and there's a lot of action. Uh, we also attend Art Crawl where we put up a display to let the community know about it if they're not already aware and give information. And when we have, um, when we will go hopefully live to be able to train new people and do information sessions, we do put up posters. So that will uh, be good to get um, help with. Is there any questions? Yeah, there are two questions. Um, one comes from Peter. Um, who asks, has the David Braley Med Center become a hangout? I heard that the old Board of Ed building that it replaced was used for plucking feathers. Um, through, there's, I've, um, through the years that I've been involved, and I believe before, the David Braley building is definitely one of the buildings that we look for the chicks. 
um, the roof is a very good place for them to be able to uh, get their prey ready to eat and take to the chicks. Cool. Um, so Peter, hopefully that answers your question. Another one doesn't pertain to the... So yeah, this is, there's two questions that are they're about the same thing. Does anyone track the falcons at the lift bridge? And the second question, do you know anything about the peregrine nest at the lift bridge? So what can you say to that? Okay, I do know some stuff. Um, so I do forget the name of the falcons that are there, but they are, they have been ID'd and if they're interested, they can send me a message and I can get back to them about the actual names. They've been there for a number of years and they do usually have at least two chicks. Unfortunately, the numbers in the Hamilton Falcon Watch are too low for us to be able to cover both nests. Um, there was talk about it and, you know, it would be great if we were able to have um, Stony Creek or Burlington form um, a way to be able to watch them. I do know that the, uh, the Canadian Peregrine Foundation is aware of this nest and at this, I'm pretty sure that they are not able to ban them yet. Uh, I do know that they were talking about doing it, but it's a lot harder just because of where it's situated. Uh, they have to get permission and they've not at this point been able to do that. Would you give me permission to share your email address that we've been emailing on with everybody? Of course. I'll put that in the chat right now. Um, Krista Sanders, 43 at Hawk com so you can email Krista there um, so you know the, the eggs have been presumed failed at the Sheridan w what is what is happening with the, with the, with you and the crews who are watching like what's what's tomorrow like what what is the week like for you monitoring the situation I know you kind of alluded to it but what does that look well, like? Well, right now what we've been doing is um, volunteers that do the feed on the street. Um, a lot of us are involved and we like to know what's going on with the falcons. So uh, a number of them have been going out on trips looking for Ozzy, trying to ID him. That's how we're, we're relatively certain that he has been hanging around still just because um, watching him for a number of years, you're able to tell certain hangouts that he likes to be at. Um, after a battle when falcons fight over territory, it can be very draining. And so he could be hanging in there because he doesn't have the energy to be moving away, or he might not be ready to give up his territory and might be getting ready for battle again. So we're definitely keeping an eye to see what happens. Um, if there is a chance that they'll need rescuing, we'll be looking at uh, sending out emergency rescue group to get him or anyone that is injured and again they would be going to the owl foundation as provided they have room so um you know i put a call out earlier to some urban birders to be looking for uh, chimney swifts so someone's downtown hamilton where is you know secretly I, I have my favorite perch to watch the peregrines where's the best spot to watch them um, or to look for their nest location um to actually the nest or where they like to perch anything where's a good spot to just observe the downtown peregrines the the parking lot across from jackson square is where we usually have the falcon watch the headquarters um because then you can see you can look up towards the nest you've got the david braley the marquee building they're starting to use that a little bit more that's the newer high rise and they definitely like to sit i forget the name of the hotel but the one with the duck there they like to sit on that duck a lot um ozzy that's one of one of his favorites and of course the stelco building um pretty much any of the high ones right in that area so if you just turn in a big circle looking at the high points you can usually find one or two of them unless they've gone further out for uh for looking for meals cool and then last question like do you I mean, like you said, you've been watching these birds for a couple of years, so you're able to kind of tell who's who. Is anyone able to kind of, like, if I, if I was downtown, like, you know, is there a way that you can, if I, if I said, like, yeah, I think I saw Ozzy. If it's not, is there any way to tell if it's not the band that it's him? Um, yes, there is. Uh, you would have to, I'd say, most likely need them to be stationary. But if you go onto the website and look at the page that says who's who, 
there will be a close up of Ozzy and Lily, and it will tell you the differences in their faces. Um, one of the easiest ways to tell the two apart is that Ozzy, where Lily's very white with the black markings, Ozzy is more of a creamy salmon color. So he's got that darker patch. I'm looking for the website right now. Sure. Uh, Falcons.hamiltonnature.org is, is one I'm seeing here, which I think is it. And should, when you open it up, it should have the, uh, the webcam there. And then in the top, kind of towards the right, you'll have your uh, different areas that you can go. So it's got the history, the who's who, the gallery pictures. So you can look at favorite pictures from previous years. They're so always what's good. The is it, it falconwatch.ca? No. Oh. Uh, just I'm looking for it up. right now. It's, it's not coming up in the tops, top hits. So I'm just trying so to... So falcons.hamiltonnature.org. I usually, when I'm going to look it up, I just Google Hamilton Falcon Watch. Yeah, so that's... And it'll, it'll come up. Gotcha. So this... Okay, so I'm going to... I'll send everybody... Yeah, because this one has the webcam. Okay, the one I just put in is the latest on falcons.hamiltonnature.org. Okay, great. Um, so, Krista, you've been doing some pretty great work with this project. It's it's unfortunate to see this changing of the guards, but it is nature's nature at play. Um, yeah. So, what's next for you? And then, it, like, you're going to keep monitoring the nest. You're looking for volunteers. Is there anything else that? that you're hoping for this year and, and how can the help club help? Um, this year, unless we actually get a second clutch, there won't be a lot in the way of needing help because it'll just be having a look and keeping an eye on the Falcons. So of course, if anyone here is out in the area looking, if you see, cause right now we have had reports of the fourth Falcon. So anyone seeing Falcons, um, the Peregrine Falcon, I should say, uh, you know, report the sightings because we can keep track of it. Um, we're trying to find out whether the fourth falcon has was passing through or if they're looking at maybe challenging and becoming one of the new adults in the nest. Um, if you look back at previous years, both Lily and Ozzy are getting on in years, which is a kind of a typical time for them to start leaving uh, just because they're getting kind of closer to the end of their life or expected life. Um, but it's you know, it's always still sad because we get used to seeing them and you know, the different behaviors that they had. So, I think it's incredible that Judson is the child of Felker, who was born in Hamilton, and so now Judson has shown up to his father's birth site. Yes. That's yeah. Crazy. And he's. Um, some people were saying that he his behavior was kind of reminding them of Madam X, which would be his grandmother. Come on. So yeah, and she was, as I mentioned in the presentation, she's the the one that's been at the nest site the longest out of all of them. So it'd be it, it, if one has to go, it's kind of, you know, this might be a nice new adult to come. Sure. Eventually it'll happen, but all right. Well, is there any closing remarks that you would like to share with the group before we end the meeting for the night? Um, one thing I wouldn't mind pointing out is um, I think we all are aware that last year's Falcon Watch was um, unprecedented. It was very hard doing it, working with the restrictions, and we were definitely down in numbers. When Griffin went missing, it was extremely hard to be able to track him and keep an eye on Whitehern. Um, but we were very fortunate that the different um, buildings were very helpful with us. A lot of the security were helping us let us up into buildings up to the top to be able to look where we normally wouldn't. Um, probably the most surprising for us last year was the Marquis building, which was still under construction. Um, one of the volunteers has the credentials and actually was allowed up um, with their work stuff to the top of the roof while the building's under construction. And from that point, it's the tallest building. So we had a great view. So it was just really nice to see more community support um, that wasn't there previous. 
so it gives us a little hope that moving forward, other, uh, other buildings are gonna work with us if there's an emergency. That's awesome. Well, this is, this is kind of a wing of the Naturalist Club. So hopefully we stay in touch over the coming years. Um, you know, if you're ever looking for further support, look our way with a bird study group um, or through the wood duck, but you're doing amazing things, you and your team um, for the health and well-being of the downtown Peregrine Falcons. And as alluded to with some of the questions, maybe there is maybe there is more to be accomplished with the Liftbridge group. And maybe they are, we, we will see more nesting pairs around here over time. I mean, there was some, there was some interesting kestrel displays uh, happening in the West End here. I've got a friend who thinks they've got Merlins nesting in their backyard in the West End. So there's a lot, a lot of biodiversity in terms of raptors around here, which is pretty cool. It, it's amazing when they're uh, they're nesting close. We actually had um, red tail hawks um, nest in the backyard last year, so that was it was pretty neat. Cool, that's awesome. Um, well, keep up the great work. Thanks for joining us tonight. I know we've got it's nine thirty, so we're ending kind of just when I said we would. Um, so enjoy the rest of your night, Krista, and we'll hopefully Thank see you, very you much. again soon. Um, for everyone else who is still here, thanks for joining us on our last night and our community night here, uh, the bird's eye view of the BSG. I hope everyone has a fantastic couple months without seeing one another through this virtual channel. But I promise to bring some, some great content for you from September onwards. And like I said, reach out anytime. Um, but hopefully tonight inspired you to do a couple of things to, to look at what's happening in your own communities and see how you can make a difference to get out and paddle and check out some, some cool spots, especially around Coots Paradise Marsh and listen for some marsh wrens. Keep your eyes to the skies when you're in urban areas and be looking for raptors and falcons. So thanks you, thank you, thanks to everyone who participated tonight and was here and is still here now. Um, stay safe and we'll see you again soon. You're welcome owner <laughs> and everybody else. Thank you, Peter. <laughs>